Hello, my name is Hans Genberg. I'm a professor of economics at the Asia School of Business, where I'm in charge of developing the Master of Central Banking program that will start next June. Before joining the ASB, I was executive director of another training institute here in Kuala Lumpur, the CSUN Center, which also trains central bankers in the region. And uh, I have also been part of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the central bank of the Hong Kong SAR, which I, uh, where I spent about five years earlier in, in uh, DK. But most of my career, I've been actually an academic. I was a professor of economics at the Graduate Institute of International Economics in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, that's where I been teaching international monetary economics, central banking policy for a number of years. And the topic that I will talk about today is related to international monetary arrangements, namely the role of the dollar and whether or not the renminbi will challenge the dominant role of the dollar in the international monetary system in the years to come. So as usual in economics, uh, Economists have different views. It's uh, as the usual economic joke goes, it's on the one hand and the, on the other hand. Uh, and here we have in one corner, Stephen Roach, the former chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia, who says, the pandemic is threatening to dethrone the US dollar and the Chinese Yuan would be another US dollar alternative in the system. And in the other corner, there is Nuria Rubini, who is professor at New York University and uh, a frequent commentator on international monetary issues. And he says, uh, paraphrasing Mark Twain, actually, reports of the dollar's early demise are greatly exaggerated. And he goes on to say that in the medium to long term, multiple factors could preserve the greenback's global dominance. There is simply no alternative. So who should we believe? Well, before I get to that, let's, uh, let me go back in history a little bit and talk about how the dollar became dominant. Because in the, in the first half of the last century, the 20th century, the pound ster sterling was actually the dominant international currency. It was replaced by the US in the middle of, towards the middle of the century as the US, United States became the dominant political and economic uh, power in the world. Now, late in the century, the, there was an interesting development in, the, in the Euro, Europe with the introduction of the Euro as a currency in the, on the continent. And at the time, there was a lot of talk about the Euro taking over from the dollar as the international currency. And in fact, two very highly respected economists wrote a uh, research paper where they uh, predicted rather confidently that the euro would overtake the US dollar in what year? Well, as it so happened, they, they said in the paper in 2008 that it would happen in 2020. Well, here we are, 2020. And uh, the euro is nowhere close to being as important in the inter international system as the US dollar. So which of these examples, either the theoretical arguments of Roach and Rubini on the one hand, or the historical examples, will describe the relationship between the US dollar and the renminbi in the years to come. But before going there, let me give two more lessons from the past. And they uh, concern the Swiss franc and the German mark on the one hand and the, the Japanese yen on the other. In the 1970s and 80s, both the German Bundesbank, the central bank in Germany and the Swiss National Bank, they tried very hard to prevent the German mark and the Swiss franc from becoming internationalized. Why did they do that? Because they felt that if their currencies became internationalized, they would lose some ability to influence and to steer 
financial conditions inside their respective economies because those financial conditions would be so much affected by the international role of those currencies. So the lesson here is that it's not necessarily in the interest of a country to have an international currency. Now, the, the lesson from Japan is different because the Japanese authorities, they tried at some point to uh, actively promote the Japanese yen as an international cur currency, partly because they were hoping Tokyo would be, become an international financial center. But they were not successful because in order to become an international currency, they had to introduce uh, financial reforms domestically and uh, they didn't do so sufficiently for the market to adopt the yen as a currency, international currency. So the lesson there is that it is market forces that determine whether the currency becomes internationalized and it's not the authorities who can do so by decree. Okay, what are the characteristics then of an international currency? Let me uh, mention just four that economists have tried to emphasize and discuss uh, over the years. The first uh, is uh, perhaps the, the simplest in many ways, and that is the use by non-residents of the currency in question. So you and I, we may be having US dollars bills in a drawer somewhere, which we take out, if you remember it, when we travel to uh, Thailand or Indonesia, because we know that the US dollar can be exchanged quite easily for the local currency wherever we go. And that is, is uh, as we'll see in a moment, that's a benefit for the, for the United States. More uh, importantly in science in any case, is that uh, an international currency is used in, in trade in goods and services as for invoicing and settlement. That means that a, a trade between a firm in Thailand, say, and Indonesia is not conducted either in Thai baht or uh, Indonesian rupiah. It's connected in what is called a vehicle currency, the US dollar, because it's simpler and cheaper to do so. Similarly, when a borrower in the Philippines wants to borrow uh, in the international capital market, they don't issue a bond denominated in pesos they issue a bond denominated in US dollars typically because that it makes it much more attractive for the international investor. But see what happens then is that the, the borrower in the Philippines, he takes on a certain currency risk which must be, must be hedged in the currency market, hedging the risk of fluctuations in the currencies and that is costly. So it is costlier for the, the um, borrower as a result of having to use an international currency. But of course, it would be even costlier still if they had to use the, uh, the, the peso. Finally, uh, an international currency, and maybe the most talked about feature of an international currency is that it is held by central banks as an international reserves to use in uh, times of crisis to intervene in the currency markets to prevent large scale exchange rate changes. And that gives a certain status to that uh, country. Now, what, what are the sizes of these uh, various characteristics? Well, take the first one, what we call seniorage. As of September this year, the, the amount of Federal Reserve notes, $100 bills and others, in circulation all over the world is $2 trillion, including the U.S. Half of it is estimated to be held outside the U.S. And think about it. How did somebody get a hold of a $100 bill? Well, they had to uh, uh, sell something to the U.S. worth $100, so they get the $100 bill, and the U.S., Federal Reserve only had to pay five cents to print that hundred dollar bill. So the, the, the other $99.99 .99 is sort of pure profit as long as the 
uh, dollar bills are held outside the United States. Uh, now, the, uh, it has been suggested by some that the international reserves held by central banks, which are many uh, times larger than currencies held outside the US, also gives rise to a benefit for the, for the US. But th that, that is not uh, quite true because these reserves pay interest. Uh, the, the Bank Nagara doesn't hold dollar bills in its vault, it invests them in uh, treasury bills and they are in interest maybe low, but nevertheless, they are in interest, so there's no senior issue involved there. Um, in terms of the size of trade invoicing, this is a picture from a paper by an IMF economist, um, which shows that in terms of trade, the U.S. count for about 10%, the, the left, left columns in the two columns in the two parts of the graph, 10% of total trade. But in terms of invoicing, and the currency share of that trade, uh, of international trade, it's about 40%. So the, the difference, about 30% there, is an indication of how much uh, trade is used by third parties as a denomination and settlement when they trade with each other. The, in terms of bond issuance, here's a, it's a graph from another IMF paper which suggests that um, international borrowers use the U.S. as the denomination for, for their borrowing in international markets much, much more than any other currency. The euro is up there a little bit, but uh, other currencies are very tiny. And as a result of, of, of this importance in trade in goods and trade in, in international bonds, if you look at the foreign exchange market, the turnover in the foreign exchange market, uh, close to 90% of all uh, currency transactions has the U.S. dollar as one side of the, of the uh, transaction. Of course, uh, every transaction has two currencies and 90% and of them has the U.S. on one side. So that's an indication of the enormous size of the U.S. Uh, dominance in, in these markets. And finally, there is the currency composition of international reserves held by central bank. And here you see that a little bit over 60% of international reserves are, are denominated in US dollars. Euro has 20%, pound sterling and Japanese together, Japanese yen together is 10. And the remaining 9% is divided up into various smaller uh, portions. And you see that the Chinese renminbi currently only has 2% uh, share of international reserve holdings. So it, it has a long way to go before it is anywhere close to, to uh, the euro, let alone the US dollar. So the dollar is dominant. How might it be challenged? Well, in order to answer that question, it is useful to try to understand what determines whether a currency become internationalized. And as you might ima imagine, economists have spent a lot of time trying to characterize uh, economies uh, as to whether their currencies are, are likely to become uh, an international currency. And first and foremost, the, the most important factor is whether the economies capital markets are open to international investors, what we call the freedom of movement of capital in and out of the economy. Because unless that is uh, uh, possible, in, international investors are not want, going to want to use that currency in, in transactions other than possibly transactions with the country, but it's not going to be used outside of the country. And uh, related to that is that whatever restrictions there, there are, if maybe they are small, but as long as they are stable and not changing, creating uncertainty um, to a large extent, this is um, uh, then, then uh, the uh, currency may become an international currency. And this is, of course, when we think about it, this is where the renminbi has a big disadvantage currently relative to other uh, 
currencies, uh, euro on the one hand, but, but uh, the dollar as a, as a dominant currency currently. Because the Chinese authorities have uh, fairly restrictive controls on capital movements in and out of, out of China, the Chinese market. Why? Because they want to protect the Chinese market from the influences uh, that might come with an international currency. Remember the, the arguments of the Swiss and the, and the Germans in the case of internationalization of the German mark and the Swiss franc. In order to, to liberalize the movements of capital in China, they have to undertake substantial reforms of the domestic financial system, uh, banking system in particular. Otherwise, uh, the introduction of free movement of capital will be too onerous for the economy. So that might uh, take, that will probably happen at some point, but it might take some, some years. So that will uh, prevent the Chinese uh, renminbi from becoming an international currency, uh, at least given current restrictions. Now the size of your financial markets is also important, as I mentioned in the case of Swiss, Swiss franc. Uh, Switzerland is just too small of an economy, even though they're, if their currency is strong and it's open to capital movements, it, it cannot become an international currency in the true sense of the world because uh, the economy is so small that it would be totally overwhelmed by international demand for Swiss francs and well, that wouldn't work. The uh, Chinese economy is of course growing, but uh, it's only still a fraction of the size of the U.S. economy. So it will take some time before it, it uh, on, the, on the argument of size, it can ri rival the U.S. in terms of, of uh, economic importance. Now, uh, there's also uh, the case that even, the, even if the Chinese financial markets are growing and are quite large, they are not as liquid as the U.S. financial markets because uh, more, uh, a large proportion of financial instruments, uh, essentially the sovereign debt of the, and uh, the debts of the provincial authorities in China are held by institutional investors. They are not traded actively on markets and therefore the markets are not that liquid. And finally, the last, last point, uh, the stability of the purchasing power there, I think there's not much difference across uh, China versus US. Uh, inflation is relatively controlled in, in both economies. But on balance then, the, um, the, the, the first two or even the first three factors that are, have been determined to be important, they are such that uh, renminbi currently cannot uh, compete effectively with the dollar as an international currency. However, the, the, it is making inroads in various respects. In regional trade, it is becoming more and more used in, in uh, denominating exports and imports. Malaysia trades a lot with China, Thailand trades a lot with China, etc. And in, in those uh, exchanges, the renminbi is becoming more important. It used to be 10% uh, of trade was denominated in renminbi. Now it's uh, more like a quarter of all trade. The rest being uh, typically invoiced in, in dollars. But it's increasing, so it's becoming more important. And as a corollary to that, because the renminbi is more important for Malaysian trade, the Bank Negara probably when they think about exchange rate policies, they take into account not only what the US dollar exchange rate is doing, but also what the renminbi uh, ringgit exchange rate is doing. They look at the corner of their eyes, at least, at the renminbi exchange rate when they think about uh, interventions in the foreign exchange market, if they do so. And finally, there is the, uh, and that of course, uh, when countries start uh, thinking about the, uh, their exchange rate relative to the ringgit, then they will also, uh, relative to the renminbi, sorry, they will also then hold more renminbi as uh, international reserves because they need them for interventions in the foreign exchange market. Finally, there are the swap agreements. This is the People's Bank of China having concluded swap agreements with a number of other central banks, 
uh, these essentially mean that the People's Bank of China lends um, renminbi or other international currencies to other uh, the counterparty central banks so that, that those central banks have international liquidity uh, if they need it in to finance trade or uh, otherwise. And of course, those um, linkages to swap agreements increases the importance of China and the renminbi in the consideration of those central banks. So that's how the renminbi is making uh, steady, but so far relatively small inroads. But then there are also ch other challenges to the uh, US which are more general and not necessarily linked to the renminbi. There are new payments technologies that uh, lessens the need for an international currency. So uh, blockchain, blockchain technologies and other ways of linking financial systems together make it possible for, tra uh, for trade between Thailand and Malaysia to be conducted in local currencies uh, more easily than it was previously where uh, trade would have to go through what I call the vehicle currency. So these new payment technologies might uh, lead to a less need for international currencies in general. And of course that uh, lessens the dominance, if you wish, of the US in the system. And then there is this um, uh, weaponizing the role of the US uh, dollar in the financial system. The US administration uh, ha uses the, the fact that the U US financial system is a center for much of international financial transactions. They use that uh, to restrict entrance of countries which they deem undesirable. Uh, they restrict them from using the system, which is of course very onerous for the country's concern. So far, most of these restrictions refer to countries that are deemed to be uh, involved in terrorist activities. But, you know, it is not inconceivable that in the future, hopefully not, but it's not inconceivable that such use will be uh, to uh, restrict also countries access for other uh, less uh, dangerous reasons. And of course, this creates incentives for uh, countries to find alternatives to uh, using the US financial system. And there are uh, developers underway to do so in Europe and other places. So it is time to wrap up. I have argued that the US dollar will continue to be the major international currencies in trade, bond issuance and reserve holdings for the foreseeable future. And I've also argued that the renminbi will not become substantially internationalized until the capital account is fully open, until the restrictions on capital movements are, are eliminated to a large extent. But even then, even if that happens, uh, historical uh, experience suggests that it, even then it will take a long time before it can seriously rival the current dominance of the US, which is so big. But then there are evolutions in payment technologies, which we should not ignore. And that may lead to a less need for vehicle currencies and trade altogether. And finally, as I just mentioned, the US administration risks scoring an own goal by weaponizing the, the current dominant role of the US dollar in the financial system. So that is what I wanted to uh, convey uh, on this topic of the dollar, the renminbi and the international monetary system. If you um, would like to discuss these issues further, uh, here you have your, my email address on top. The, um, the second link is to uh, central banking initiatives at the Asia School of Business, where you can find uh, sort of initiatives that they have taken that relate to central banking and monetary policy issues, seminars that are going to take place that you can uh, log into and, and other events. So uh, if you're interested in these issues, please uh, check that out. Otherwise, uh, have a great day ahead. Thank you.